is ready. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court. Counsel? Uh, my name is Vidya Reddy, and I'm here on behalf of Theodore Gather Cole. Um, on appeal, Mr. Gather Cole urges that he should be afforded a new trial owing to the district court's uh, refusal to inquire of the jury regarding potential exposure to a highly prejudicial news article that was published during the course of trial. Um, in State v. Bigley, uh, this court adopted a framework that under certain circumstances imposes on district courts a mandatory duty to um, make inquiry of the, the jury to determine whether exposure has occurred to a mid-trial news publication even though um, no evidence of actual exposure exists. Um, other courts have interpreted that type of framework to, to essentially require a three-step procedure. Um, first, the, the court must make a threshold determination of whether the material at issue raises a serious question of possible prejudice. If that threshold um, test is satisfied, then the court must then proceed to polling or canvassing the jury as a group to determine whether anyone has been exposed to the material. Then, if someone has been exposed to the material, um, that juror must be uh, questioned or bore dired um, outside the presence of the remaining jurors to determine the extent of exposure and the, uh, the degree to which it affects their ability to sit as an unbiased juror in that particular case. Can the um, material be prejudicial if it is contrary to the testimony that was presented at trial? Under the circumstances of this case, Your Honor, yes. Um, in this particular case, the, the central issue at trial was identity, and the, mis the factual misstatement contained in the article went specifically to identity and indicated that there was a palm print at, um, uh, that, that connected defendant to um, the crime. Although the trial evidence did indicate that the palm print was actually the victim's and not the defendant's, um, there are still substantial dangers of, of prejudice. First, the jury could, it, the jury, if it, if it, if it um, was exposed to the, the article, could have concluded that it misremembered the information from trial. Um, number two, the article reads in such a way that um, it appears uh, that information or testimony from trial is interweaved with information received from another investigating officer, kind of outside of trial. Um, and so it, it suggests that perhaps um, there's, an, in addition to what the information that was presented at trial, there's additional um, evidence connecting the defendant to the case that did not come in at trial. And in this case, it was not a clear, uh, um, a clean record in terms of the physical evidence that came in. Um, the scene was initially investigated and then it was closed because they believed they collected everything. Then they went back and got more information. But Ms. Reddy, I mean, didn't the prosecutor concede both in opening statement and in closing argument, we have no physical evidence linking the defendant? It's, there's eyewitness testimony, but no physical evidence. The prosecutor does say that, um, Your Honor, but um, the jury is also aware that not all information pertaining to the case always comes in at trial. And in fact, in this case, there's specific um, discussion dur during jury selection to that effect. And they're also told that in, uh, in, in various admonitions and jury instructions. Um, and so I think there's a very real possibility that the jury could have concluded that additional information existed that did not come in at trial because of some legal reason or consideration. Um, and, and that this additional information actually supports the defendant's guilt. Following up on the prejudice issue, uh, I'll approach it from a little bit different angle. Um, you know, as, as you know, in this case, uh, the district court refused the request that the jury be polled. So um, since prejudice resulting from the, the extraneous publicity is such an important question here, um, what should we make of the defendant's failure to file a post-trial motion and offer supporting evidence about whether or not any of the jurors were in fact exposed to this. It seems to me that that would have been a, a, a fairly plausible um, course of action by the defendant to, to establish that uh, 
there was reach that, that this information did get to the jurors and could have ser seriously impacted them. So it's almost like a, a, a failure, to, failure of proof problem or almost a waiver of prejudice. Would you respond to that? Sure, Your Honor. Um, first, the Big Leap procedure recognizes the difficulty of obtaining actual information of exposure. Um, and that's why the Bigley procedure seeks to intervene um, even though there's no evidence of actual exposure um, that's collected through the means that you describe. Um, and it seeks to intervene at a time when that information can be obtained and can be obtained in, in a relatively unburdensome way because all the court has to do is engage in this polling and then maybe that second step tells us that no one was exposed and we're done. Um, so, so I, I don't think that in, that issue of whether there's been um, even post-trial indication of actual exposure um, undermines the argument under Bigley and, and the reason to abide by that. Yeah, I'm, I'm not talking, talking, of course, about post-trial exposure. I'm talking about proof of mid-trial exposure. Sure, sure, and, and that's what I mean, that even post-trial, you know, not being able to obtain information of mid-trial exposure, because ultimately that still depends on the jurors voluntarily disclosing. Uh, certainly post-trial, there's no longer the prohibition of communicating with jurors, but that doesn't mean that jurors have to accept those communications or respond to juror questionnaires or um, volunteer information in any way. But well, couldn't, couldn't the court, on a motion by the defendant, require the jurors to come in and say after the fact whether they read it or not? And whether they saw it, I mean, he, instead of making the onus on the defendant to go out and, and talk to 12 people, uh, it seems to me if the, if the court could on a post-trial motion just have the jurors come back, can't take more than a half a day, if that long, and say, did you see this article? And if they didn't see the article, it's the end of the thing. And, and wouldn't you think the defendant would have to, you know, do something like that to, to get over the prejudice prong? I, I don't think so, Your Honor, um, because First of all, Bigley tells us that, that the article needs to be brought to the attention of the court um, and that it has to be done before the verdict is returned. Um, Bigley talks about Sefcheck, in which, in which case the defendant you know, waited too long, waited until post-verdict to bring the, the article to the attention of the court. So from the preservation of error perspective, um, you know, defendant has to bring it pre-verdict, and that's what defendant did. Now, if the court wanted to kind of modify the remedy and say, you know, I don't want to do it now, but I'll do it after the, the, the verdict is returned, um, then that was, you know, up to the court to do. But to affirmatively, you know, suggest that defendant has to, again, you know, re-request that this procedure be followed when a proper request was made and denied by the court, um, I, I think is not appropriate well, under this that, framework. I mean, as I read the colloquy with Judge Jackson, he was concerned, and I think with some justification, about their juries in the middle of deliberations, pulling them out of deliberations, and then you're, you're going to you're going to kind of do something, taint the deliberations in some way by interrupting them. And given that concern, wouldn't it have made sense for defense counsel to renew the request and say, "All right, well, if you're not." If, if you don't want to do it now, can I, re can I ask, if necessary, that, that, that this occur after they return in their verdict? So perhaps that wouldn't have hurt, um, but I, I don't think that it, it changes the analysis given what's happened, because a proper request was made, it was timely made at a time you know, when the court could have engaged in this procedure and dealt with the error, and it was denied. Um, and, and again, if, if, some, if some kind of modification of the remedy like that would have been appropriate, to, uh, the, the district court was free to, to do that on its own. Does it make it? We expect lawyers to ask for the relief and not judges to sure. think outside the box ahead of the lawyers. That's certainly true. E even but though our, our judges do that a lot. Sure, that's certainly true. But, but here, the, the counsel asked for the relief that's provided under the law, under Bigley, which is to, to engage in this questioning. I think there's also some concern, perhaps, of, you know, that, that, that engaging in this questioning procedure after the verdict is returned is less likely to um, yield honest um, answers by a jury that has already returned a verdict, has already concluded, you know, that the defendant is guilty, and perhaps is is more reluctant to, um, you know, to provide information that would undermine the verdict, even when the questioning comes Ms. from the court. Ms. Reddy, um, in this case, the uh, 
jurors would have had to go fishing for this material when, in other words, they would have had to violate their admonition to d find this material, is that right? I don't think so, Your Honor. Um, How's that? The, 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 the jurisdictions that have adopted the ABA framework recognize that admonitions alone are not sufficient. Um, largely in part of because of, because of the risk of, of inadvertent exposure. Um, um, it, the danger is that even if individuals, even if jurors don't purposely go out and look for the information, they may come across it um, personally, um, or uh, they may be told the information by friends or family or, or something like that. But is that something the trial court should, should weigh in deciding whether or not to interrupt the deliberations and make a determination? Because I mean, with all the information that's out there on the internet and through blogging, uh, how are we going to know when to check to see if jurors have violated their admonition, have gone home at night, got on the internet and surfing through and finding information about the trial? I think it depends on, there's kind of two pieces of it in terms of there might be prejudicial information that exists, you know, pre-trial already on the internet, and we rely on the jury selection voir dire process to, um, you know, get at that any exposure to that, um, and and to deal with that issue. But but jury selection process obviously cannot do that with with an article that is published during the course of trial. Um, and, and in terms of when we um, engage in that affirmative inquiry, I think it's when one of the parties brings to the court's attention in a mid-trial publication that um, it poses a risk of prejudice in its content. And not every publication is going to. In the vast majority of cases, the, 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 dis the material that's disseminated during the course of trial is going to be usually purely factual, and it's going to be accurate, or even if it's not accurate, it's not going to be inaccurate in a way that's really important um, to uh, you know, the determination of the case like it is here. That goes to the central issue. So if there's a, someone blogging at night about uh, the trial that every day the trial court's going to have to make an inquiry to see if any jurors have been exposed to someone blogging? I think if, if the blog at issue contains something that's outside the record um, of what already comes in at trial um, and, and that content is prejudicial and that is brought to the attention of the court, then yes, I think the court makes that inquiry. And it would be insufficient for the judge just to simply admonish the jury every night or whatever, every morning. Remember, don't read at the blog. Stay off the internet. That's not enough. Yes, you're. No, it's it's not enough. Um, also, the oh, I'm sure, were you? Uh, does it make a difference that this was the the uh, Cedar Rapids Gazette, the leading local paper? That um, I mean, isn't that a, a a stronger case to ask the to to require the district court to have, to pull the jury? than some individual blogging. It's just more likely that people read their local paper and might accidentally see it or hear about it from somebody else who does. That's exactly right, Your Honor. This is not um, a extremely obscure publication that the jurors would not have reason to come across. Um, it's not a paper on the other side of the country um, or something like that. Um, and, and in fact, the, the admonition at issue um, while directing jurors to avoid coverage on this particular trial did not advise them to, did not say don't, don't look at media at all, don't, don't read your paper at all. And so I think particularly in light of that, there is a heightened risk to the extent, you know, that's part of the threshold inquiry, the danger that it actually reached the jury and some threshold But, but you're rejecting that piece or you want us to reject that? piece of the inquiry, right? Isn't, don't you want sort of a per se rule if the material is prejudicial and it's brought to the attention of the court, then the jury, and there's a request to poll the jury, then the jury has to be polled? I suggest kind of two alternatives. That's, that's my first um, proposition is that it should be focused just on the content. Um, and if the content is prejudicial, then, then and a proper request is made, then we have to proceed to polling because that tells us for sure whether there's been exposure or not. Alternatively, admittedly, a number of courts do look both at the content and at um, you know the prominence of the publication, but but none of those courts have imposed quite so high a threshold as the Court of Appeals suggests, and 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 defendants' position is that even even if there is some 
quantitative in, um, threshold um, examination, like the Court of Appeal, of Appeal suggests, it should be minimal. Um, you know, if you don't have sequestration, um, and the, the article is, or the publication is not tremendously um, obscure so that re there's, n you know, no risk of exposure, um, then we should proceed to polling. Does, am I correct, am I correct that the, uh, uh, the record doesn't reveal whether this article appeared in the, in the hard copy of the paper? That's correct, Your Honor. It Record only reveals. Doesn't reveal. It does not reveal. It does not reveal. No. Thank you, Counsel. Thank you. Ms. Trick. May it please the court, Counsel. Uh, I want to start, given the questions of the court on this error preservation or waiver question. I think if you read the discussion of both counsel and the court uh, on this issue. First of all, I think it's clear that nobody had the Bigley standard in mind when they were making this determination. And the district court ruled uh, basically that deliberations are uh, important and it's a big deal to interrupt deliberations, and so I'm going to decline to do that. But wouldn't that, wouldn't, you know, that's what bothers me about the case is that the judge is making a decision for the defendant that he'd be better off not interrupting the deliberations because had the judge interrupted the deliberations, asked the questions, and found no prejudice, we wouldn't be here today. And is it the judge's place to, to take away a defendant's right because it may be better for the defendant not to interrupt the deliberations? And that's the real thing that's bothering me. So how do you get around that? So I'm not sure that I agree that the judge's determination was it would be better for the defendant or better for the state to interrupt the deliberations, but simply that that's not a thing that the court is willing to do. That's not a thing the court does. Once deliberations start, we let them continue. But I think the ruling definitely leaves open not just the possibility of post-trial motions, uh, but as the prior question suggests, perhaps the exact remedy the defendant was seeking just three hours later when deliberations had completed. And I actually think that perhaps that's a better remedy for the defendant. He's allowed to find out, certainly if he was found not guilty, that would be the end of the question, uh, exposure or not. Uh, and it allows him to find that out before the questioning. But I think that the court uh, didn't deny the defendant's request to have court assistance in finding out if anyone is, was exposed to this article. Do you have like a new air preservation rule that if someone makes a proper objection by dumb luck, that the court shouldn't really apply the objection because the court didn't know about it either? I mean, that doesn't make sense to me. Well, I don't think it's a new rule. I think it's the same rule we apply that a preliminary ruling. I think the court was well aware, as well as the parties, that not everybody was aware of what the law that should be applied at that time was. And the court said, well, I'm going to make a preliminary ruling at this point. I'm not going to interrupt deliberations. But if you find some case law or if you want to bring this back up after the verdict, I'll certainly hear that. And although I uh, admit that his ruling wasn't that uh, expressly you should say this again, I think that uh, it was very clear that the court was not foreclosing the possibility of reconsideration of the question, and therefore it was a preliminary ruling and does not preserve error. Our, the language of, of some of our cases at least suggests that uh, the, the, subs, the subject of prejudice can be addressed either uh, through an inference uh, from, from an inference about the subject matter of the publication or through, uh, through something other than an inference, affirmative proof that there was, there was exposure and that it was significant and, and that sort of thing. Uh, give us your best argument that, that uh, the publication in this case about the palm print, the defendant's palm print, was not so, so serious as to raise this inference without other proof of prejudice? So certainly I think uh, it's a state's strong position that the, the article itself was not in fact highly prejudicial. We would disagree with the characterization of the article as suggesting that uh, it could be reporting uh, suppressed evidence. I think the article is pretty clear that the reporter is reporting on the testimony that was presented that day at trial. It's labeled, uh, the headline is labeled uh, the state's uh, attempts to explain its lack of physical evidence. 
uh, and purports to report that there was a witness that testified that they found one palm print on the truck and it was uh, identified as the defendant's print. Now the testimony at trial was that there was one palm print on the truck and it was identified as the victim's. Those are mutually exclusive pieces of information. Both the article and the testimony at trial agreed there was this palm print found on the truck. It's merely the identity of the match. And uh, the repeated testimony of the witnesses and of the state's opening and of the state's closing made very clear to anybody in that courtroom that uh, it was the victims. And frankly, the state doesn't quite understand how the article could have been printed. It is that incorrect. Perhaps the reporter left the room and made an inference because he should have been there and wasn't. I don't know, but uh, I think anybody who was present in the courtroom who reads that article would have been well aware that that's an incorrect statement of what the state's witnesses testified well, to. Well, anybody, I would agree that anybody in the, in the room who's trained as a lawyer and who is really attentive to language might might have seen it that way. But but we're concerned here about the the understanding of lay people, how they might have read this article. And isn't it possible that that a lay person, a juror who might have read this article might might um, give some thought to the possibility that maybe there was some evidence that got excluded yeah. or or what this is fishy. How come there's a different um, version of the facts printed in the newspaper? So I would have two answers to that. First, I think lay people think less about this than lawyers do and not more. And so I think it's more likely that they're, that they're not going to conclude something strange is going on, but simply that the newspaper reporter was mistaken. But secondly, uh, I think that the state agrees the question here is whether or not the totality of the circumstances raise serious questions of possible prejudice. And uh, a part of that determination has always been, in the cases, uh, a discussion of the manner of uh, publication and uh, the manner in which the uh, admonishment was uh, given to the jury and information such as that. And in this case, the jury was properly admonished repeatedly, including specific assertions. At the end of each day, the judge didn't simply say, you remember that admonishment I gave you at the beginning of trial? He said that, but he also said, and remember, when you go home, don't look at news articles, don't look at uh, uh, anything related to this case. And while he does say related to this case, uh, I think that we presume, uh, absent evidence otherwise, that the jurors followed that admonition. And that makes very relevant, that presumption makes very relevant the fact that in this case, I don't think you can be exposed to this material without intentionally violating the admonition. Uh, I have a question for you. What, what, what's our standard of review on the acts of the district court here? Is it the abuse of discretion standard that I guess I've been relying upon? So, yes, it's a uh, state's brief uh, and the state now takes the position that it's an abuse of discretion standard. I think Jones, a court of appeals case uh, from 1993 cited in the state's uh, brief, uh, asserts that the standard of review is abuse of discretion, and I think that makes sense because the court, while it's, an a, mandatory determine, it's a mandatory duty to poll the jury, that mandatory duty only occurs once the court has made a determination that the facts here raise serious questions of possible prejudice. And that determination is a fact determination based on the totality of the circumstances. And so re a review of that determination would be for an abuse of discretion. Aren't we really, aren't we really uh, struggling here with a question of fair trial, though? And if that's the case, why isn't this a constitutional question? Why shouldn't it be a de novo review? And, and why shouldn't we be able to substitute our judgment about the facts? So I think the defendant here is clearly raising a uh, uh, claim that the the rule adopted in Big Lee is a violation is is the violation in here and not the due process violation and I think that's reasonable. If you read Big Lee, uh, that was a due process claim and in that case the newspaper article which was printed not online uh, during trial uh, stated that the defendant had previously pled guilty to these charges and he, there was only an there was only a trial now because he had been successful at getting that overturned on appeal due to procedures 
with relation to the guilty plea. And I think that when we're talking about lay people and the prejudice as to that information, that that information must be drastically more prejudicial than the information here. And so if that uh, under Iowa law is not a due process violation, I think you need much, much more than we have here for a due process violation, perhaps including information that a juror was in fact exposed to this information. Um, I do want to uh, make sure that I uh, point out that it's not just the fact that this uh, article was in print that uh, requires the uh, jurors to have violated their admonition to see it, but the fact that the headline was very clear that this is the case that they are talking about. Uh, which would alert the juror to stop reading and that you'd have to read the body of the article to gain the uh, incorrect information. And while I recognize that it's possible somebody else read this article and began talking to someone about it, that would also be an opportunity for the juror to say, please stop talking before they got to that information. It's not like a promo of the nightly news or something that someone could hear before they had an opportunity to stop. And also, this information was so incorrect that if any juror had heard a friend or family say they heard this, they would certainly know it was wrong. It's, it's simply unbelievable given the facts that were presented at trial. Uh, the, I don't know that the state. Uh, I want to go back to this standard review. If you go back to Bigley. Mm -hmm. Bigley's based is based on the case of uh, Sefcheck, uh, and that's how they it was dicta in Sefcheck, which got to Bigley and Sefcheck. They said it was a due process de novo type review. It was a fair trial issue. Cor so, correct. So why wouldn't it be a, uh, a de novo review of whether he got a fair trial if we're going to the basis of where Bigley came from, which was a a constitutional issue. So I think Bigley was also a de novo review. I think defendant Bigley was raising a due process claim and therefore review is de novo. But what Bigley said was there's no due process violation here. But we're going to take this opportunity going forward to direct all courts to apply the ABA rule. And, uh, and it is the violation of that rule that the defendant now claims. Um, uh, uh, you know, abuse of discretion is such a loose term. It, it means untenable, unreasonable, or failure to follow the law. And if Bigley's the law and the court failed to follow it, where do you get abuse of, you know, any discretion in that part of it? Well, Bigley says that the law is uh, that if this material is disseminated during trial and it goes beyond the record, which uh, then the juror, then they may on their own motion or shall on the motion of either party, uh, poll the jury so long as that information raises serious questions of possible prejudice. And I think that is exactly the kind of determination that we leave to trial judges to make in their discretion uh, during the trial. They're there, they're, uh, they're on the ground in the community, and they have a much better feel for uh, whether or not the facts of this case raise questions about the possibility of prejudice to this jury. And so that is in a... So your position, you have to do it on the reasonable and intentable grounds and not the violation of law ground? Yes, I think, uh, yeah. I think that the, the, the court's determination of whether serious questions of possible prejudice are raised. And I think that the Court of Appeals agreed in 1993 in Jones that the standard of review here is abuse of discretion. Should the court be more reluctant to question the jury during deliberations as opposed to, you know, during the evidentiary part of the trial? Yes, for a couple of reasons. First, I think uh, that we all recognize that it would, uh, it's more of a disruption and would stand out more to the jurors if we bring them out and ask these questions. It would be highly uh, disruptive to the deliberations. Also- But isn't that the defendant's choice, whether he, he or she wants to disrupt it? And the defendant takes it at their hazard. It's not the judges, and we're not paternalistic about this stuff. The defendant goes to jail, not us. So why should we be paternalistic about it? Well, so I have two things. First of all, I don't think that it's only the defendant who uh, may suffer from a disruption of deliberation. The state has an interest in allowing the jury to deliberate on the case in a clean and consistent manner. Uh, but I would also point out that uh, the state the also has an interest to provide someone with a fair trial. It's so not a game. 
where you could do wins and losses. I mean, the state has an obligation under the standards, as I understand them, to ensure that a defendant gets a fair trial. But I think Bigley says that this is not a question of a fair trial. It's, it's a rule violation. But the second thing I just want to make sure that I point out is that by the time the jury is in deliberation, the alternate has been released. Uh, and so the remedy available at the time of deliberation is not the same as the remedy that was contemplated when the rule was adopted. So I think it's fair to assert that the rule was adopted in contemplation of getting defendants and parties to raise these issues at a time early enough that we can solve this problem. If we pull the jury and we find a member of the jury has been exposed and is now uh, going to prejudice the defendant, we uh, can dismiss that juror, raise the alternate into a position, continue with trial, and everything goes on normally. At the time uh, the defendant uh, was asking for poll here during deliberations, the most likely and probably the only remedy would have been mistrial. Well, there's no reason to ask that during deliberations. Post-trial motions are a perfectly viable way to raise that claim, and the same remedies are available at that time. So I certainly think there are also remedy determinations about whether or not the Bigley rule even makes sense when we're talking about in deliberations. So I'm out of time, so. Thank you. Thank you as well, Ms. Strick. Ms. Reddy, your rebuttal. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, starting with this question about whether um, this is potentially a constitutional error, um, which can also feed into the standard of review, uh, I want to mention, you know, that's a little bit unclear, and, and other courts have taken different approaches to that. Um, so specifically, the Hawaii uh, court in um, the, the case that's cited in, in the briefs um, equates a failure to engage in this um, polling uh, with a constitutional violation. And the way they get there is, is they say, look, if, if there's no polling done to determine whether there has been exposure, the reason we can't tell if there hasn't been exposure is because there was no polling done. And so we engage in, um, at that point, a presumption that the material reached the jury. And if the material reached the jury, then there's a due process violation because the outcome was not based solely on what happened happened at trial. Now, admittedly, that is not a uniform approach. Um, the hearing court um, in, in, in the Fifth Circuit, um, they are declined to, to reach the question of whether it, failure to engage in polling where required under this framework amounted to a constitutional violation. They said, you know, look, this is something we've imposed as a, as a matter of our supervisory authority, um, and, and, and um, they granted a remedy, but they didn't reach the question of whether that equated with a constitutional violation in that case. Um, and so our defendant's position is that, that under this framework, when, there, when polling is required and it's not conducted, there has to, the remedy has to include this, this assumption that, that the, mate the prejudicial material reached the jury. And at that point, you end up with what is a due process violation. Counsel, uh, I'm, I apologize for coming back to it, but I, I come back to this question of why is there a need for a presumption, particularly in this case? We just, you know, the jury comes back, we file a post-trial motion, we put on the proof about whether this any of this information got to the jurors. Because Why shouldn't we just require that? Why shouldn't we expect it? And do you mean a post-trial motion showing, showing that there has been exposure? I, I think because, again, it, it, what underlies this framework is a recognition that it's, it's, it's very, very difficult to actually prove exposure even when it's occurred. Just the fact that we can't prove it doesn't mean that it didn't occur. And so at, at a point where the content of the, of the article is prejudicial, that's why we engage in this framework because we can get to it and we can, we can bring it to light at a time when we can do something about it. Um, and a defendant's right to fair trial. Well, um, but a, a juror's not going to say it post-trial. Why would they say it during trial? Well, I mean, I mean, it doesn't make sense to me either the juror is going to be honest or not honest about it. I think the the likelihood of getting honest answers is is much higher when it is pre-verdict. Why? Like, because there hasn't been an ultimate determination by the by the jury um, that, that they're married to, quite frankly. Um, and so I think the idea is that that when it comes pre-verdict, um, we're much more likely to to get at the actual answers. Um, 
even even when you know we're com we're comparing questioning by by the court in both circumstances as opposed to things like juror questionnaires and things like that that you know the parties can can utilize um, at that time um, on the standard of review um, defendants position is that we should adopt um, de novo review um, and and state v holly out of new mexico as well as state v jones out of the fifth circuit um, um, follow that same approach um, and it, to an extent that the, the, the case law and due process um, uh, analysis, for example, Shepard talks about the, the duty of appellate tribunals to make an independent just so determination. I, just so I'm clear again on the standard of review, you've cited New Mexico and the Fifth Circuit. Any other circuits uh, have a de novo review like that that you're talking about? Those or are, the, are most of the states using the, the abuse of discretion standard? Those are the two cases that I noticed. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure exactly how that lays out. But admittedly, a number of jurisdictions do use an abuse of discretion standard. Even under that standard, though, um, it, it's, it's satisfied here. Um, and for example, um, I believe it's the Uh, in the Harper case, uh, it, it, the court determines that there was an abuse, applies an abuse of discretion standard and determines that it was an abuse of discretion not to engage in polling. And that was a case, again, where there's not overwhelming publicity. It was a news article that was buried in the paper, but the content was very prejudicial. And so they determined it was an abuse of discretion for the court, at, for the district court at that point, not to engage in polling. With that, uh, Theodore Gathercole would respectfully ask for a new trial. Thank you. Thank you as well. The case is submitted and we'll now hear the arguments in the Marshall case.